This talk begins in Washington, D.C. with a story. In 2007, Don McKay, Dick Berg, and I were hailing the virtues of our geologic mapping program to Gene Whitney, a senior science advisor to the president, on the seventh floor of that red building down in the corner there. At a certain point in our pitch, we pulled out a three-ring binder full of support letters, and this somewhat severe, world-weary advisor just lit up. It turns out it's not every day that scientists show up with hundreds of written testimonials. Gene Whitney said something that stuck with me. He said, people come he through here all the time seeking funds for new research, but often the problem is not a lack of science. The problem is that the decisions are made by thousands of individuals and local governments without the resources to get the science or the incentive to use it. Using science to improve decision making sounds so simple and holds such promise, but it really is a chronically difficult task. And despite decades of effort, decision makers still don't get the information they need and scientists produce information that's not used. Our institute tackles this challenge head on. Our mission is to deliver science to decision makers to help the economy, the environment, and the people. It's enshrined in our statutory mandates and it's the reason the surveys were founded 160 years ago. Our scientists, our collections, our data, our whole structure is the product of past and continuing public investment in us to make good on this idea, to link science to decision making, to make better decisions. And as we've seen today, we do it. The question is, can we do it better? I'm going to try to make the case that yes, we can do it better by being smarter about and by doing more public engagement. And I'm not talking about press releases or an enrichment activity. I'm talking about engagement with the users of our science as an integral part of our science mission. Scholars in this field say that to be used and useful, Science has to be seen as credible, salient, and legitimate by its users. Credibility means just what you think it means. Is it good science? Is it going to withstand scrutiny? Most scientists stop there and just focus on doing excellent science, but that's not enough. Science must be salient with its users. Will it save money? Will it save lives or a resource that people care about? No matter how good the science, if it's not salient, it won't be used. And the third factor is legitimacy. Perfectly good science can still be rejected if its producers or its users are seen as unfair, dismissive, or hostile to particular interests. On the other hand, an open and inclusive process can build trust. So credibility, salience, legitimacy. Useful science needs to pass a sort of threshold test with all three. But you can't just maximize them all because increasing one sometimes comes at the expense of another. Attending to these three factors takes some care and finesse and real expertise. The literature refers to organizations that fill or seek to fill this niche as boundary organizations. Now the name comes from the idea that scientists and decision makers occupy very different worlds. Creating salient, legitimate science requires lots of give and take with stakeholders across the boundary, while also maintaining the boundary to protect the credibility of the science. There's actually a custom-built test bed for these ideas in Arizona State's Decision Center for a Desert City. <clears throat> that was put together by the thought leaders in this field, and it's attracted over $10 million from NSF to produce policy-relevant climate science for area water managers. But there's a problem. DCDC is staffed by faculty who, as we know, are under underlining pressure to publish basic research in peer-reviewed literature. A recent review found that the water managers were having a hard time getting them to do the kind of science that they actually needed. Faculty have their own resource and incentive problems. As we know, the institute and the surveys are very different, and we make good use of these boundary functions in shaping our own work. Sometimes we act as a boundary organization, and sometimes we partner with them. But either way, our best programs have these three key elements covered. First, our scientists work directly with the users of our science. Specialists with the water survey consult with dozens of stakeholders when they update floodplain maps to tap local expertise, establish trust, and promote dialogue around flood risks. Second, the Institute holds itself accountable not only to science, but to the groups we serve. Our advisory board includes members from the university, but also state agencies and the major industries of Illinois, and that list continues to grow. And third, the Institute creates tools and products that have value to scientists and practitioners. The regional water supply plans were co-managed by a group of stakeholders whose input greatly increased the soundness, the relevance, and the acceptance of that plan, and thus of the Institute. So rather than being a diversion from our science mission, communication and engagement with our users is actually what defines our brand of science. And it's exactly what the policy and the academic community say is most needed. 
Gene Whitney thought so anyway. The Mapping Coalition got a 50% increase that year. Thank you.